Tuesday, 20th June, 1837, Kensington Palace. <sighs> I was awoke at six o'clock by Mama, who told me the Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Cunningham were here and wished to see me. I got out of bed and went to my sitting room, only in my dressing gown and alone, and saw them. Lord Cunningham, the Lord Chamberlain, then acquainted me that my poor uncle, the king, was no more, and had expired at twelve minutes past two this morning, and consequently that I am queen. Lord Cunningham knelt down and kissed my hand, at the same time delivering to me the official announcement of my poor king's demise. Since it has pleased Providence to place me in this station, I shall do my utmost to fulfill my duty towards my country. I am very young, and perhaps in many, though not all things inexperienced. But I am sure that very few have more real goodwill and more real desire to do what is fit and right than I have. We have just heard from Queen Victoria on the first day when she discovered that she was going to be the new Queen of England, which is a very impressive, a very amazing, a very uh, awe-inspiring thing. Who knew at that time that she was going to become one of the longest reigning uh, monarchs mm -hmm. of, the, of England and was going to have a huge influence not only on England, not only on the empire, but on the entire world? Yes, and only at 18 years old. How would you like to take on the largest city in the world and the largest, one of the most important countries in the world at 18? That was constantly expanding throughout her reign. Constantly, constantly. So we have here today with us Miss Marie Walker again, Hello. who uh, has these wonderful costumes and has a really <laughs> great grasp of this fascinating topic, this fascinating woman, and this fascinating period in time. So Marie, tell us why you like Queen Victoria so much. So I really love uh, young Queen Victoria because I see a lot of, not necessarily myself in her because she's you know, Queen of England and I am definitely not, but I think she was a young woman who had a great position thrust upon her that she was not necessarily prepared for. She was prepared for it, but in a very odd way, which we will get into in a tad bit. Um, but she was so convinced that she was going to do good. When she realized she was going to be queen, she wrote in her journals, which she kept extensive journals throughout her life, I will be queen and I will be good. <laughs> which I think is an incredibly like, powerful statement. Yeah. Um, and also, it's in very large contrast to what she saw as the debauchery of the Hanovers um, of her uncle's reign. And she wanted to be a very stark contrast to what the court that he held that she didn't really get to experience because of the way she was brought up, which was the Kensington system. So she was raised in Kensington Palace by her mother and Sir John, which was her mother's uh, advisor, I guess is the best word for him, perhaps. <laughs> the kind of boyfriend? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perhaps the kindest word would be advisor. But um, <laughs> he 
was a very domineering man who did not have Victoria's best interests at heart and controlled her mother and tried to control Victoria. But Victoria was incredibly stubborn, and perhaps that's where I see myself in Victoria. Um, and she refused to give up any type of power to Sir John uh, at all. He tried to have her sign over that if she was to become queen before her 18th birthday, that he would then be regent, or her mother would be regent. So her mother would rule Victoria, and Sir John would rule the mother, uh, is how he saw that. But Victoria, even when she was very sick, and they tried to like get her to sign all of these papers while she was like incredibly sick while on tour. Even in her ill condition, she refused to sign over these papers and to give up power. And her uncle, also wanting to avoid a regency, because they had just come out of the regency period, and they didn't want to go through that again, literally held on to his life long enough for Victoria to turn 18 and had said, I am going to try to live until you turn 18. He died, she turned 18 in May and he died in June. So he, um, I don't think he, I think everyone kind of knew that Sir John was scheming to get the throne and no one wanted that to happen, perhaps. Well, once she ascended to the throne, what did she do with Sir John? Oh, she exiled him, I think. I'm pretty, she banned him from her presence. And then I think she kind of tried to scheme to get him as far away from herself as possible. But he didn't play a, a single other role during her entire... No, life. I think her mother kept Sir John in her household because she was very fond of him. Uh, but Victoria wanted absolutely nothing to do, including just looking at the man. Uh, there was actually quite a scandal right when she took the throne that actually dimmed her popularity a little bit, and that was um, the deal with Lady Flora. And she thought Lady Flora and Sir John had a um, affair that left Flora with child, because these are both two members of her mother's household that she greatly disliked. So it was not hard for her to imagine when she saw Lady Flora's abdomen swelling that these two had perhaps um, not behaved in the most upright of manners. And therefore, she had Lady Flora examined uh, to see if she was with child, which caused Lady Flora great distress and um, humiliation uh, because she was not actually with child. She had a tumor uh, attributed to liver cancer. But this greatly, um, at the moment, diminish Victoria's popularity because like how could you do this to this poor ill woman how could you cause her such distress at uh, this time when she's already incredibly ill but it was really she was trying she didn't like John or Lady Flora and was trying to um, defame them and uh, trying to get them out of trying to scandalize them so that she didn't have to deal with them at all but it was a very good learning point for Victoria because she was an incredibly young queen and she learned very quickly how the press and scandals and how to behave oneself were of the utmost importance as well. Well, that's an interesting segue because you were talking about uh, the shift from the Hanoverian yes. reigns to, to what came to be the Victorian era. <clears throat> to contextualize it in a nutshell, the <laughs> Hanoverians were... Um, Flagrant, they were rambunctious, they were boisterous, they spit like crazy, they uh, had illicit relationships with all... Now, not just not just the, the royal family, this was the, the tone that they set for the entire aristocracy. So the entire aristocracy dressed in wild fashions, they, they had various mistresses, they spent incessantly, they yelled, they screamed, they gained... And so this is, I think this is what you're talking about, when mm -hmm. Victoria sees herself eventually coming to the throne, she knows she's going to set an example, and she wants to set a very, very different example. So Marie sort of talk us through, you know, she wrote, I want to do good. Mm -hmm. From Victoria's perspective, what is the good that she wanted to accomplish? So Victoria's ideas of good probably are a little bit different than what we have today, and they evolved throughout her reign, and especially when she ended up marrying... Uh, her husband, Albert. Uh, but 
I'm just going to talk about this because I see this is one of the very visible differences as in the fashion from the 1830s to the 1840s. My dress is more of an 1840s, 1850s style. It's very up, very modest. Um, it has like a fan front bodice. And the 1840s could be said to be rather a plain style of dress versus the 1830s, which was probably the most outlandish things you've ever seen. Um, of the, these huge puff sleeves that rival even 1980s fashion. They're, it's more ridiculous than that. Um, and just the hair is up to here, and it's the most wild and outlandish, lavish fashions. And then it, when she takes the throne, it, it calms down. Um, and that's another one of the things. The 1830s had also been a time of great um, reform in the... Uh, the British nation. There were a lot of reform bills passed. 1840s, not so much because you're getting used to a new queen. Um, even though she had very, she should, she was supposed to have very little to do with politics. The queen is supposed to be above politics. So Victoria liked to meddle a little bit. Um, and she was very close to Lord Melbourne, who was the prime minister when she took the throne and really a father figure to her as well as a political mentor. And he was part of the Whig Party, which was probably the more liberal progressive party. Um, and she despised the Tories, which I thought was incredibly interesting because they're all about God, Queen, and country. Uh, so you would think the people who were like cheering God save the Queen enthusiastically would be the party you would want to align yourself with. But she really aligned herself with Lord Melbourne and the Whig Party. And she absolutely hated Robert Peel, who was the leader of the Tories at the time, or for a good portion of her reign, because she outlasted a lot of prime ministers. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Um, but then when Albert, when she married Albert, which I always, I love their love story, because it's, it's a real love story. It's not just a political advantageous match. Um, they really loved each other. And they, along with King George III and Charlotte, are one of the two few royal marriages that had no mistresses or um, cheating involved with that, that we can tell, and seem to be very loving relationships. Um, but her and Albert, especially when Albert came, Albert was incredibly, um, also wanted to have a very morally upright uh, aristocracy uh, to set the tone, that he came from saxon coburg gotha which they were actually cousins, which isn't really unusual for this time period with the royal aristocracy. Not first cousins. No, they, they were just like distant. third cousins. Yes. Or something, something like that. But like the whole aristocracy at this time is slightly interrelated, and then especially after Victoria, because she had so many children and made so many advantageous marriages. <laughs> uh, she was called the godmother of Europe or the grandmother of Europe because World War One was basically a family squabble uh, to some extent. Not really, but. A lot of royal families who were distantly related to each other were all going at it in Europe. But that's Queen that's, Victoria. That's 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 another live stream. We'll do that one later. later. <laughs> um, but back to Albert, he also pushed Victoria and to be, uh, I guess, the kind of prudish idea of Victorian mannerisms that we think of. But as well as really caring about the people and caring about um, technologically technological advancements um, and really supporting the, the little person in the Victorian era and, era and trying to come up with ideas for progressive housing for poor people, trying to get people out of not necessarily like the slums that we think of, but uh, to have some type of housing for them. He was also very involved with Lady Lovelace and the royal science community, um, trying to uh, for forward uh, science um, as best they could at that time. He was also responsible for the Great Exhibition, which displayed all of these uh, technological advancements in medicine, farming, like everything, in 1851, I believe? No, it was... And it was 51. I think it was right. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was the early 50s. Um, where they... that would, And that made him incredibly popular with everyone, because they were showing off Britain's power and progress to the world, um, which Albert really championed, and Victoria was devoted to Albert and anything he wanted to do. She, his happiness was a great, was a great, meant a great deal to her. So she supported that as well. Um, 
which was a tragedy when he died in 1861, just 10 years after that. Um, but by that point, the public had begun to like him much more, I think, especially with the Great Exhibition of 1851. It's written that he, they probably hit their public peak, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, especially with Albert. Because at first, uh, no one wanted her to really marry Albert. Well, her mother did. Her mother was a, was thought she had kind of arranged the match to an extent because it was kind of like her cousins and like the uncle Leopold and which was Queen Victoria's uncle. I think her mother's brother. Aristocracy family trees look like this, but uh, they kind of tried to get them together a little bit. But they were the only ones who really supported this. Parliament really didn't like this because they thought the Germans were trying to take the throne and there was... Again. Again. Yes. That's because... what you have to remember is the first, George I, the second, and the third were more or less German princes. They were from a German royal house. And so Great Britain had just had three monarchs worth of German rule. They finally get them themselves what they consider a, a native daughter. To, was, to the Isle of England, and suddenly yeah. she's going to marry another German? That's not that, that did not sit well with a lot of people. No, so they very much were against this German in the house, uh, or in Buckingham Palace, but she still married him and then fought to get him accepted, more or less, uh, because not, not a lot of people wanted to do that at the beginning of her reign. Um, yeah. Well, so you were, you were talking about um, Albert's dedication to the furthering of science and technology and things like that. And while Victoria herself, of course, was not actually in the factories or designing mm -hmm. things, much of her reign is identified with this phenomenal growth in business and in industry and in machines and technology and the railways and steamships, all these things. Now, part of that is because her reign lasted for so much of a, of a time span that a lot of things happened. But a lot of these things first happened in the, in the early part of her reign, and then the rest of her reign sort of took advantage of that. So talk, talk to us a little bit about some of those advances and how they began to shape what we picture as Victorian England. Yes, because when Victoria takes the throne, it's a very um, more agrarian society. And then as her reign continues, it builds up into what we really think of as Victorian London with the railroads and everything becoming more connected and the factories and uh, all of this great progress that we think of, but also with the progress also comes with the, the factory laborers and children, child labor um, and things of that. And then all of the reform movements, uh, which Victoria... Victoria uh, supported some, but not all. Uh, she was interested in the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, she refused to aid the South during the Civil War because I believe, to quote her, the peculiar institution of slavery. Mm -hmm. She was very much against that. Um, Britain had ended the slave trade, I think, before she took the throne. Uh, but British colonies were still using the slave trade and using slave labor, and she was more interested in stopping that. Uh, she was not incredibly uh, favorable towards women's rights. She herself thought that she should answer to no man because God had made her queen. But other than that, she thought uh, women was should answer to man in the society. Uh, so she wasn't really a champion of women's rights in that sense. But despite being an incredibly strong female figure who ruled for 62 years, um, she was not exactly favorable to helping women gain the right to vote or hold house seats in parliament or anything of that nature. Uh, she had lots of children, nine children, mm -hmm. uh, and we think of the Victorian era as this great domestic uh, time. Like uh, during this time, the idea of like the cult of domesticity happened, where the idea of the woman in the home and the woman being the central focus of the home and creating this wonderful sphere for the man to come into out of the public life. And it was the domestic sphere which the woman kind of ruled, um, in a sense. But Victoria uh, and she, she hated babies. She really, she thought newborns were incredibly ugly. 
Um, she also suffered from what we believe, again, using modern words describe things that happened in the past are not always the most accurate way to do things, but what today we would call uh, like postnatal depression or postpartum depression after almost all of her pregnancies. So uh, she, she did not like being pregnant. She likened it to being like a cow. Um, and she felt like she, also during that time she couldn't really attend all of her public duties because in that time they, you would have your seclusion, which is basically like the end of your pregnancy, like your third trimester when you started to show a lot, the woman would be seclu like sequestered into her own house and wouldn't go about in public duties. And I think that really bothered her because she liked to be very active. And even if it wasn't going out in public, she liked to go out walking and riding um, and things like that, which you technically weren't supposed to do in that condition, or not everyone thought you should do in that condition. But she's the queen. But she's the queen, and literally everything she did, if she did it, it was, became acceptable and very fashionable. So while she didn't yield much political power, she wielded an entire, so much social power. Because if she did something, it, cert it became okay to do it, uh, which is kind of like the monarchy of today, where they don't wield much political power, but they do still wield a good amount of social power. So the idea of like drinking tea or having afternoon tea, mm -hmm. uh, Queen Victoria did that, so it became incredibly fashionable. And I think, uh, speaking from our region, the South, like Georgia in this time period, um, they like to kind of think of themselves as the, the, the planters like to think of themselves as the aristocracy. So everything that Victorian England did they like to do as well. So people here might have afternoon tea if they wanted to think of themselves as like high society or something of that nature. Of course, uh, it's they're, they're still across the sea, but at this time, British weren't incredibly favored for a very long time in America um, right, right. because well, of the whole revolution thing. Right. But, and, and, but, but a lot of, the, as you say, a lot of these social fashions and movements do start to come over to the United States because we have, because of the technological advances, printing presses that can put pictures in newspapers. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not, not photographic pictures, but like woodcuts and, and drawings and illustrations going to newspapers that come across the ocean, which allows you to see fashion. Mm -hmm. The fashions can be copied. Uh, the railroads can be copied. Um, one of, here's, and this is one of the things that a lot of people don't think about that the Victor that Victoria and Albert themselves started that we still do today. If you're if you're at home and if you celebrate Christmas and if mm -hmm. you put up a Christmas tree in your house, raise your hand. That specific tradition in the English speaking world began with Victoria and Albert. They just mm -hmm. because Albert brought it from Germany said, I would like to put up a Christmas tree mm -hmm. <laughs> in Buckingham Palace and they did. And they did not say, hello, everyone, we're going to Buckingham Palace, we're going to have a tree. They just did it. And because it, people saw that there was a photo of them in the newspaper from those new printing mm -hmm. presses that was distributed around the world, everyone decided they wanted to be like Queen Victoria and Albert and put up a Christmas tree in their own home. So, yeah, so, so then everyone started having Christmas trees. Christmas cards, same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's still with us today. So the, uh, the influences of even the social aspects of the Victorian period are very much with us, the, the technological, the scientific, and, you know, a lot of the, the behavioral. I think the idea of what you're talking about of the, of the idea of the woman as the center of the, of the family, as mm -hmm. the heart of the family and the domestic, um, the person who's in charge of everything domestic certainly comes from this mm -hmm. period. And that was, that was considered the basis of the nuclear family. What we think of today as the nuclear family Started here. It's Victorian England. Another tradition she started was wearing white for your wedding. Uh, white wedding dresses were not popular until she married Albert, and she did it to show off British lace that was made on her in her country. Uh, and up until this time, and especially in more like even in uh, to the medieval times in Europe and uh, that region, uh, blue was the favored wedding color of like wedding gown color of choice. Of course, there wasn't one that was necessarily like standardized like there isn't today it's not standard that you wear white right. but everyone does <laughs> um <laughs> if you're in like the western english speaking world more or less like most of the time you wear white and that was started by queen victoria um to show off the lace on the wedding gown that was made i think um 
perhaps was it Spittlefield? I think Spittlefield. That it sounds Spittlefield right. Spittlefield lace that she uh, wanted to show off, and then everyone since eighteen four. Oh, whenever she married Albert in the eighteen forties, <laughs> we've been wearing white wedding dresses ever since then uh, because it was so popular. And again, she didn't mandate that everyone wear white, but she did it, and then everyone else wanted to. But I think she was aware that that would happen as well. Mm -hmm. For example, the, the whole reason that she wore that lace is because the lace weavers had said, you know, dear queen, we're, our industry is in serious trouble. Since we've gotten away from those crazy, fancy Hanoverians, no mm -hmm. one's wearing lace on their mm -hmm. outfits anymore. People have gone to a much more, you know, um, formal, uh, more constricted type of fashion, and no one's ordering lace. So if you would wear just a little bit of lace, it would really help us out. So she did. Bing! Overnight. The lace, lace weavers are back in business. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, Victorian morning customs, uh, when we think of uh, what we do for funeral practices and such, um, a lot of that, hap a lot of what we do comes from when Albert died um, in the middle of her reign in 1861. And that's the the widow's weeds, the the mourning customs, the, like the veils, the wake, the and of course, like all of these things were around before her, but because people saw her doing it, it became incredibly formalized um, and incredibly, I guess, more pronounced. And people realized and wanted to emulate what she did. So, uh, for example, like the the widow or widower wearing black for a whole year and a day. Uh, from the year of the spouse's death, generally the women. Uh, it's men were they had to wear like a black armband for three months and then could remarry. Uh, but women were supposed to only wear black for a whole year or muted colors. As the time got closer, they could wear like lavender or gray. Um, once you entered third morning, because there was first, second, and third morning in the period of this year and a day. But that was something Queen Victoria. Well, she just wore black for the rest of her life morning Albert. Um, but there was whole books about these type of things and mm -hmm. etiquette books that were written trying to emulate all of these things that people thought polite society did. But also, I think we have the growing middle class in the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. And the middle class wants to emulate what these higher-ups aristocracies do because they want, there, there's a certain amount that I guess in the British class system and even in any type of class system that you think of as like there's the top and they have certain customs and things that they do that you kind of just have to know um, and if you're in the club, if you're in the, you it, yeah the if you're in the club like otherwise you don't like know and then if you that, that every so you're in the club and then no one else can get into the club because they don't know what you know so these etiquette books and things were trying to I guess were very popular with the middle class and such because it, it gave them the secret code book uh, to get into and pretend to be like these upper class and eventually infiltrate them because they had money. Well, and see, and that's another thing too that this this it's sort of a perfect storm. It all comes back together. So because of the advances in manufacturing and industrialization, lots of consumer goods become oh. widely available that before were out of the financial reach of mm -hmm. most people. But because there's a lot being made within, with industry, they're cheaper and people are getting higher wages so they're able to afford things that help. They can emulate the upper class. Mm -hmm. they, they can get China. Now the China, for example, the teapots, the tea services they buy are not going to be as nice as the ones the aristocracy have. But they still look pretty good. From a distance, they look the same. They're still able to eat similar foods, they're able to wear similar types of clothing, they're able to um, just get these little whatnots and knickknacks that they just mm -hmm. put up on the wall. When you, when you look at uh, a, a pictures of Victorian houses, I think the, uh, the decorative motif during this period was very much a glorious clutter, is yes. that the way to put it? It's just Victorian clutter everywhere, on mantles and windowsills and tables, there was, there was no horizontal space uncovered. It was to have this kind of consumer culture that was started, to have all these knickknacks showed your status. And they also loved like bringing the outdoor indoors, so like seashells and peacock right. feathers and all of these perhaps somewhat exotic things. Because if you had a seashell, that means 
you could have gone to the beach because you have a train and you can travel and you have money to get there. So it's also a status symbol. Right. And you, you had a vacation. Yes. You have some questions. Oh, questions. Let's go ahead and, and open it up to questions. Okay, so uh, Ethan, who is 10 years old, wants to know, was anybody executed under Victoria's rule? Yes. And <laughs> repeat the question. Oh, the question was, was anyone executed under Victoria's rule? Yes. I don't know how many, I'm not sure for what necessarily, but executions were still right. around and, during and, this and time I, period. Ethan may be thinking along the lines of an Elizabethan uh, reign off with their heads with the dukes mm. and the earls who rebel against them. There was nothing, uh, to my knowledge, there was nothing in a rebellious state like that, but there were, capital punishment was still very much a thing in Victorian England. And also transportation was a very large idea of punishment. So you might be sentenced to be executed, but then you could have your sentence commuted to transportation, which was where they stick you on a boat and they take you to Van Diemen's Land or New South Wales or um, Australia, uh, where you were then to live or serve out your sentence there, and then you, you don't really have a way to get back, so you end up <laughs> living but, in that place. But it helps expand the, the British Empire that way by people in its colonies. Mm. With criminals. Yes. Um, so when was she born and how did she die? She was born in June 20th, got, uh, 1819? <laughs> it was, uh, May 20th. 20. 20. Okay. 1819. Another year, right. Uh, so <laughs> she was born uh, May 24th, you said? 1819. And she died in 1901. I think just of old age. Yes. Yeah. Possibly some type of sickness, but mainly old age. At that point, she had lived to be. Oh, math is hard. <laughs> yes, I do yes. history, not math. Here's here's a, a little side note for everyone watching at home. Eighty-one. In, here at the Northeast Georgia History Center, we historians know a lot about history, but we're not very good at specific dates. <laughs> so generalized so. dates. We have a timeline in our heads. <laughs> Um, yes. She was 81 when she died. And, and can you talk about Osborne House, your background that we have here? Ah, yeah. Where did she live during her reign? Uh, so she started out at Kensington Palace. That was where she was raised. And then she was actually the first monarch to have Buckingham Palace as her official royal residence, which it has, again, another trend Victoria set. Um, it's been the official royal residence to this day. That's where... Uh, Queen Elizabeth II's royal residence is. Um, of course, they have large royal estates and multiple royal estates. You have Windsor, Osborne House, like the one behind us, Balmoral, um, Holyrood Palace. Uh, the last two I mentioned are in Scotland. The other are all in England for my mm -hmm. uh, geographical. Yes, and, and I think Osborne House was, was the one built sort of as a seaside vacation home. Uh, this is, I think it's, if I'm remembering correctly, it's something Albert wanted uh, much more than Victoria. He wanted to get out of the capital uh, and, surprise, be a father and, and have the royal family be more of a family and less of a figurehead and less ceremonial. Because, of course, in London, Victoria actually does have, can have a busy schedule opening this or meeting with that or meeting with ministers and everyone wants a little bit of her time, whereas the thought was if they could build a home outside of London, and they could just all go there somewhere near the, the sunny seashore and get some of those seashells by the mm -hmm. seashore, they could be more of a family and not be so much of a figurehead. And because while Victoria still, she didn't like, she thought little babies looked weird, she still intensely loved her children. And she would write, you know, when they were married off eventually, even though she pushed back back the age. I think they her oldest daughter, they wanted to marry off when she was 14, and Albert and Victoria didn't like that, and they pushed it off until she was 17, because they thought 14 was too young, even though, the, I guess, perhaps in earlier times, it's, you know, they're 14, they're old enough to get married, but they pushed it back because they wanted to have their family, they loved their family, mm -hmm. and they wanted her to be ready uh, herself to get married, and she would write to her daughter extensively after she left the house and after she got married about how she missed her and she like wells up with tears to like look at her other daughters and sons knowing one day they're all going to uh, get married and leave. So they had a very close-knit family and a very loving family um, even if it started out a little rocky right. with the babies. 
Uh, was she the longest reigning queen until Elizabeth II? So was Queen Victoria the longest reigning queen until Elizabeth II? Yes. So Elizabeth II surpassed uh, Queen Victoria a few years ago to be the longest reigning monarch. Mm -hmm. And let's see, can you talk about um, her greatest challenges as queen? What would you Ooh. say her greatest challenges were? That's a... Hmm. Victoria's greatest challenges. Yes. As queen, as queen. I guess uh, if I had to pick one, uh, I would say there were two. One was finding her place as a sovereign, as a young lady, in amongst all these old men of government. You know, that's that's not an easy thing to do for an eighteen-year-old girl, no matter how well prepared she is. I think that was tough, and probably this. The other big challenge is as she goes through life, as she goes through her reign, she loses Albert, and then mm. that totally shifts and changes the way she sees herself, the way she sees her family, the way she sees her role. Because as you said, they're very, they're they're truly in love. They are truly a couple. And when she loses that part of herself that was Albert, how could anyone be the same after that? She didn't make any public appearances for years after that, um, to the point where the public criticized her because, of course, they under the public understood there's a, a period of mourning to be had, but they thought she was dragging it out um, and not performing her duties of, as queen anymore. Um, so eventually, I think her uncle talked her into just sitting in a carriage that would pull her around London for a public a public outing, so the public could see that she was still alive and well. Um, I, I would probably say that was, losing Albert was probably her greatest challenge while she was queen. I think another one would be after Albert's death, because she was so seclu she secluded herself, um, a Republican government kind of formed uh, and gained power because the queen was no longer there being the figurehead that she is, the crown. And there was a small amount of time which helped her get back in public sphere of do we need a monarchy? Should we get rid of the monarchy? Um, and there was a, a little bit of a tense time where they actually left the city of London to one of their more secluded uh, palaces because things got a little tense. Mm -hmm. But it didn't last long, but I would assume that would definitely be a challenging time when someone wants you gone. gone. Were there any wars when Queen Victoria ruled? Oh, yes. Oh. So many. Oh, how many wars were there? Or were there war? Oh, were there any wars while Victoria ranked? The answer is yes. There were so many. Uh, and there, this, as a, again, as a military historian, this is a uh, fascinating time. There aren't a lot of gigantic wars. There's nothing remotely like the Napoleonic Wars, which had preceded uh, Victoria's reign in the late 1700s and early 1800s, but as her empire spreads, she, uh, her, uh, the British military begins to go into all these different colonies and settle these colonies and secure these colonies. They have to fight sometimes the native peoples in those colonies. They have to fight other European powers going into those colonies. And this is sort of the golden age of, of British imperialism and the stiff upper lips and, and the, the good soldiers and everything. And it's a fascinating time period from a military standpoint because somehow, and this, this is the thing that, that historians wrestle with today, is this small island, comparatively small island, with a comparatively small army somehow goes out and conquers the largest empire the world had ever seen. This is where we say the sun never sets on the British Empire because there were so many colonies all over the globe that literally the sun was up somewhere on British territory. And a lot of them were small wars. Probably the biggest war during Victoria's reign was the Crimea. Mm -hmm. That's what I would, I would say. say. Uh, where uh, uh, Britain and France allied together to fight against the Russians and kick them out of the uh, out of Crimea, out of the, the, the area there around the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the military actions were much much smaller. Who would have? Who made Queen Victoria's dresses? And who made your dress? Ah, okay, so the question is, who made Queen Victoria's dresses, and then who made my dress? So Queen Victoria would have a dressmaker. I'm 
sure she had many, because she had a nice wardrobe. She was queen. Uh, she had to look nice because she was representing Britain. So uh, you want your your representative to look nice and to look well put together and well dressed uh, because she represents the nation um, as well. So she would have like, she had dressers and dressmakers alike. I don't know if, I'm sure they have uh, names recorded, but I am not familiar with any of them off the top of my head. And I made my dress. Yeah, would you like to present? Oh, to sure. So we can, <laughs> Here, we can, I'll stand up because it has, it's pretty and poofy. <laughs> so I have my dress here. Um, it's more of a mid-Victorian dress. So uh, it has a little bit of a fan front bodice. Um, this is a chemise tucker. So it doesn't actually go all the way down. It just, it, it stops like right here. Um, but again, it's like modesty um, to have this. This dress would probably be, I would date this to be around 18, late 1840s, maybe 1850s, uh, possibly into the early 1860s. But you would have to be uh, older and dowdier to wear a fan like, front bodice in the 1860s. Um, because uh, if you had a dress made up, then you would wear that dress until it gave out. So if you were a young woman getting a nice dress in the 1840s or 50s, you would wear that until it gave out and perhaps change it up a little bit. Um, but yes, this is definitely, I have a, like a Medici belt here, so which was very popular. Um, I have my uh, chemise, my corset, my pantalettes, um, a hoop, and then an over hoop, uh, over petticoat, over my hoop. Um, and that's to smooth it out so you don't see all of my little hoop rungs, which is doing a pretty good job of doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. All right, so our next question is, um, so when, when did her reign start and end? Another date question, which I can help you out with. I think it began in... 1837 into 1901. Yes. All right, here we go. Not sure about exact days, but those are the years. <laughs> and uh, what was her full name? Oh. Wait. I have it as uh, Alex... Alexandri yeah, Alexandrina... Alexandrina. Alexandrina Victoria... Uh, That's all sex. Right. Saxon Coldberg Gotha. Oh, okay. Once, once she was married. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, uh, did Queen Victoria have a good relationship with American presidents during her reign? Did Queen Victoria? The question was, uh, did Queen Victoria have a good relationship with American presidents during her reign? I don't recall. She never came to visit America. Mm -hmm. I don't recall any. Presidents going over to visit her. They didn't. They did not. Uh, the relationships between uh, the United States and England during this time, uh, the early part of it, I would say, was tense because for early American history, the, the British are sort of always the enemy lurking in the background. We had to fight them against them in the Revolution, the War of eighteen twelve, and even after that, there were still concerns with the the Northwest Territory and areas like, Northwest United States, uh, Northwest North America. And so things could be tense. The Civil War created a lot of tension between Great Britain and the United States because of naval issues, uh, because of a lot of private British firms were selling the Confederacy weapons and equipment. Not the British government, but the British government wouldn't stop the private firms from selling to the Confederacy. And, of course, this bugged the, the North, the United States. But I think as, as time went by, there was never a point where they were going to get into war, but of course expansion into different parts of the world with the British Empire. I think Victoria probably had more to worry about on her plate than trying to overawe the Americans. Mm -hmm. So how do we know what she looked like? Ah, uh, the question was, how do we know what Victoria looked like? And we have a lot of paintings of her, but we also know what she looked like because we have photographs of her. Uh, photography is another one of those mm -hmm. fun technological advancements that came around in this time. So we don't just have an idea or interpretation of her because a lot of times people would have portraits painted to make them look a bit more flattering than perhaps they were. But we know exactly what she looked like because we have photographs. And it looks like she was the first British monarch to be photographed. Ah, yes, I guess that's true. Yeah. So she was the first uh, British monarch to be photographed. Let's see. Um, and did any of her children become queen or king? So the question was, did Victoria, uh, did any of Victoria's children go on to become king or queen of a 
well, obviously there was her son who became king after her. Um, and then yes, Edward. Edward. Yes. The seventh. <laughs> fourth, I think. Fourth. There's a lot of Edwards. Yes. Yeah, Edward the fourth. Yes. Ah, sorry, not the seventh. We are. I guess we never even have a seventh. We are far, far yeah. away from the seventh. Um, and then she had children. Um, I think one of. It might, I'm not sure if it was her child or grandchild that was the last German emperor before the war. It was. It was. It was, it was her grandchildren. So. Mm -hmm. um, so she had quite a few daughters, uh, and those daughters would marry heads of state of other monarchs throughout Europe. And so what would happen is her children, uh, except for uh, except for her son Edward, who as who ascended the throne after her death. And it does look like it is the seventh. Edward the seventh. Look at yes. you being ah, right. Ah, nice. Okay. Um, so. Uh, that was the only child of hers that actually became a king. Several of them became queens uh, to other kings in Europe. What that means is a lot of her grandchildren were actual kings of Europe, uh, of Russia, of Germany, of England, obviously, of um, Den Denmark. Well, she, it was orange at the time, and then it became like the Netherlands. Yes, I think because. Boundaries and names were also changing right. throughout her entire reign. So, so literally, that's what that's what Marie was talking about earlier during World War One. Um, this is uh, the crown heads of Europe and the countries that go to war. They're literally what does that make them? First cousins. Imagine going to war and all the first cousins are the heads of the countries that are fighting each other. It makes for an awkward family reunion. <laughs> What kind of gifts might she have been presented with from other countries, or, or uh -huh. was it a, a custom? So the question was, what kind of gifts would Queen Victoria be given or presented from other countries? Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, what were some of the things? Um, I know she was actually the first British monarch since Henry VIII. Met the uh, so Henry VIII met the King of France on the field of golden cloth, and that was a big to do. Um, and no English monarch had met with a French head of state until Victoria went over and met uh, the current King of France at that time. And I think I'm sure they exchanged gifts and things, and right. he invited her to a naval dedication of some sort because it's always been kind of a uh, you present the king or queen with some type of token or gift that would represent your country or your industry that your country is well known for um, as kind of a a gesture of goodwill. A gesture of goodwill, and if you were, again, a different state presenting the present, you wanted to show that you were prosperous as well and could compete with Great Britain. So I think, I, I want to say one of them, was like a golden pineapple, uh, like they had cast this golden pineapple, because a pineapple is a traditional symbol of friendship and hospitality, and so if you get a golden pineapple with encrusted with gems, well, that's a very pretty thing. Um, and a lot of the things they received, I think, went into the Victorian Albert Museum, mm. uh, which of course was founded by Albert, uh, Victorian Albert in England. Uh, that was uh, also used to sort of highlight British industry, British history, and things like that. So a lot of these gifts could be tiaras, they could be dresses. As you said, they would represent uh, the giver of the gift, whether it was the French Republic or the lace weavers of, of you know, of England and things like that. They're going to give gifts that, rep that are representative. Where was her palace located? So the question was, where was Queen Victoria's palace located? Um, she has a lot of them <laughs> um, located all over her empire, but the main one would be Buckingham Palace, which is in the heart of London. And Balmoral is in Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, Windsor is just outside London. Yes. Uh, not just outside. I mean, it's about so, an hour or two by train. About an hour or so outside of London. Uh, Mandy wants to know what kind of shoes would she have worn? <laughs> ah, so what kind of shoes would Queen Victoria wear? Um, they have like. Uh, 
well, there would be like slippers um, that she could wear that were kind of like our black flats of today, which might be used for uh, dancing or about the house. Um, black boots. Um, we also think we think of like I think of the quintessential Victorian black boots with the little buttons up the side, um, or black loose black boots that might have been laced. Uh, they could also be different colors as well. Uh, and they also like to do one where like the shoe was one color, but then the toe and the heel were another color. Was uh, was she involved, or was Britain involved in the triangle trade during the time? Of the, I guess that's the that's a slave trade. Oh yeah, so, yeah. Ah. The question is, uh, was Britain involved in the uh, triangle trade? That's a, that's a little bit earlier. Um, as as Marie said, rightly they 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 did away with the slave trade. The uh, triangular trade was where. Uh, finished goods would come to America, uh, raw materials would go from the United States to England, slaves would come over from Africa, rum and molasses and things would go from the Indies up to North America. By this point, that specific uh, exchange is more or less in the past. Uh, there are still slaves coming over uh, for, the United, for the West Indies, I should say, until Great Britain puts a stop to that. But... The trade that Great Britain is involved in, this is one of the, the ways they're able to become a world power. It goes everywhere. It goes to India. This, this, is one, this is the reason you have colonies, so that you can bring raw materials from the colonies to the mother country. They go into these massive new factories. They're created into manufactured goods, and those manufactured goods go out to the colonies. That's, that's sort of the trade we're looking at now, rather than the triangle trade. It's mercantilism. Did she have any pets? The question was, did Queen Victoria have any pets? And the answer is yes. She had a Cocker Spaniel or a King Charles Spaniel um, named Dash that she loved greatly. And she had Dash from her childhood up until um, Dash passed away. Um, very close to the time where also Lord Melbourne passed away. And she took their deaths both fairly hard. Oh, I happen to see, uh, looking at her pets, the Shah of Persia presented her with a pair of Tibetan goats upon her ascension to the throne. So that goes back to our gift. Oh, yeah. Yes, so I guess she also had a pair of goats <laughs> from the Shah, the Shah, the Shah of, of Persia. Persia. <laughs> I don't think she loved them like she loved Dash, though. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll end today with, um, what do you think the importance of Victoria's reign is? Why was she oh. an important figure? So our last question is a very, uh, I guess, open-ended question of what was the importance of the Victorian reign or the Victorian era and its lasting influence on us today? Um, I would probably think a lot, we can trace a lot of our trends and our traditions, a lot of the things that we think of a very traditional, we can trace directly back to the Victorian era. Um, what Victoria and Albert did in influence has inf uh, influ what they did in their social influence has influence still on our lives today. Uh, we still wear white wedding dresses. We still have Christmas trees. We still sing a lot of um, Christmas. We sell we sign Christmas cards. We sing Christmas carols. Um, we still do a lot of things. Uh, for mourning customs, we, we wear black to funerals that she popularized. Again, that was, these things were like before, around before her, but she just brought them very much to the forefront of society. And if you were anyone who was anyone, you wanted to do that as well. And I think that is still carried on into our lives today. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so there's things we do today that go directly back to this time period. And again, there were, it's hard to overstate how many not just social advances, but technological advances and economic uh, advances and changes there were during this time. And it had such a huge impact on the world that I think it's kind of hard for us to define all those changes unless we assign that time period to one specific person who was there for most of it, hence the Victorian era. That's, that, that's why I think her name attached to this particular time period, not only because she was queen, but because she came... For the British people and for a lot of the world to represent all this massive turning of, of world history from one thing to another. During her reign, there were massive changes, and you could say the modern world began. Mm -hmm. That's all the time we have today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marie, for Absolutely. joining us again.
Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have a program on George Washington Carver, so we hope you'll turn in for, not turn in, tune in, <laughs> tune in for that. Um, and if you can support us in any way financially, please do so by clicking the donate button on our website. But no matter what, please tell everyone you know, your friends, your family, to come and enjoy all these educational programs that we do for classes, for adults, for students at home. And until tomorrow, we hope all of you have a safe time and take care. Thank mm-hmm. you.